Hi, you're listening to Avenue Insights. Any views expressed in this podcast are based on information available at the time and are subject to change without notice. Thanks everyone for for tuning in today. Um, Bill and I just thought as a follow-up to our last podcast, we would go through and and highlight some of the topics that we talked about in the most recent case study for the Avenue Q1 2021 letter. And uh, we're gonna keep this short and sweet, but we thought um, a couple of the topics that we'll discuss today are very topical right now. And so we thought people might enjoy a little bit in-depth conversation on that. So Bill, maybe, um, you know, uh, the, hot, the title of the case study was uh, inflation versus the velocity of money. And I thought maybe a good place to start as a little bit of a background would be highlighting for people why inflation and the level of interest rates are so important for stock market investors today. Yeah, this is, uh, I love that we're doing this today because again, the, the case study, we sort of put them out as sort of a, an interesting read each uh, each quarter. And it's not necessarily what's happening in the portfolio and what we're doing right now. It's sort of the bigger topics that are going on in, you know, in the investing world. <clears throat> and can we just address, you know, very technical issues. And if for in, in this, we're actually trying to go into real detail where we don't try to oversimplify. This is the issue. This is really interesting what's going on in the world. And we think we've got two great slides today that we really want to highlight to people. And so uh, also backing backing up a bit and saying, why are this important? I mean, we sort of talk inflation versus, um, you know, the velocity of money, but just highlighting why this is so important. Uh, and it's and the topic is the level of interest rates right now. Everybody can understand it in terms of, OK, interest rates are low. I can borrow more money my and housing prices go up. But the, the important thing is, is that stock market also is very sensitive to the level of interest rates. When interest rates are higher, the stock market's trade at a lower multiple. You know, it's this idea of 10 times earnings if the interest rates are at 8%, but now the interest rates are getting closer and closer to zero. This is where this, the historical multiple that you'll pay for a stock, whether it's 15 times, but right now we're trading at 22 times earnings, and you'll pay that much because interest rates are so low in your borrowing costs. And there's an awful lot of leverage in the stock market. So now that's, that's sort of the, the concept of why interest rates are so central to the valuation of the stock market. And what we're dealing with right now is that interest rates have come off the bottom and we've had this incredible acceleration, the slide that we'll show from the from the quarterly report. And uh, it's it's not that interest rates aren't still at a low level. We use the U.S. 10 year um, Treasury yield is what sort of sets the tone for the stock market. And at 1.6, 1.7% where we are today, you know, it's still a an, what's called an absolute low level but it's come from half a percent in three months. So it's over 200% rise, which has never happened in history. It's an incredible acceleration. And so the worry is, are interest rates going back to being, you know, to being at a more normal level? In which case, should the stock market come off just because the how much we pay, pay for stocks should come off, the market, that market multiple? Should we go back to the market trading at around 17 times earnings? And so this is the important thing we want to sh show today is just these two charts that show that there's something else extremely important going on, not that there's headline inflation, but how, you know, how is the money circulating in the economy with these two charts? But Brian, I'll, I'll throw it back to you just to, again, hit on this concept of like the, the big theme today and it's just for the last six months is we have printed all this money, uh, you know, central bank spending, um, government stimulus, and we've and we've just flooded the market with money. And is is that the actual, has that actually happened or is there something else more subtle going on? So a, it's a great segue. And I think the, uh, you know, there definitely is something more subtle going on under the surface. And, and um, when you've seen the headline numbers in how much money supply has gone up, um, I think, you know, for, for the year last year, it was north of 20%, which is the most that's ever gone up. And so, when you look at a chart of the money supply year over year in 2020, you know everyone then inevitably comes back to saying, look at all this money that's been created and printed. There's got to be inflation on the horizon. But the subtlety of this uh, sort of overall equation, if we bring back uh, a view from a monetary perspective, is that if you take the equation of GDP equals the money supply times velocity, 
velocity is really the thing that is not discussed uh, frequently because um, it's kind of arcane and, and complicated in terms of its interaction, um, both in the economy and more broadly. But velocity really is the subtle part of the equation that isn't discussed. And so if you look at a chart of the velocity of money, it's actually collapsed to you know, record low levels um, in the last hundred years. And so what that means is even though governments and central banks have created all this money, if, um, you know, with money supply being as high as it is, at the same time, all of that money that's been created is not circulating through the economy. Um, and you, we can go into a little bit why that's happening. A significant reason is, is if you look at the overall levels of debt, when you get to uh, these levels, um, it, it's much more harder for banks than to lend out additional money and to create uh, credit growth from a traditional bank lending perspective because the, um, the investment or the, the, the lending environment is less conducive to loan growth. And so if the banks aren't lending out money, you know, that's going to be a reason why velocity um, uh, is not increasing. And, and there's you know, other reasons why velocity is not increasing as well. I think the, the lack of productivity in, in new investment opportunities or lending, all of those are, are key reasons why velocity has collapsed to where it is right now. But to bring it back to the inflation piece is that when you have uh, you know, money supply uh, going off the charts one way, but velocity going off the charts the other way, what happens is it's almost like you know, the mirror opposite of each other. And so you get a, uh, you know, a really a bit of a wash where it's, it's very hard to create inflation when you have velocity collapsing like it has. But what happens is when you create all this money supply, the money then gets trapped in the financial system, which then leads to you know, booming asset markets, whether it's stocks or real estate or um, things like cryptocurrencies. And so that money that's been created is hitting um, certain parts of the financial markets or asset markets, but it's not going out into the real economy. And you know, the transmission mechanism to the real economy from all that money that was created is really where you would get true inflation. But because the, the velocity is, is collapsing like it has, that money is not leaving the system into the real economy. And so it, it's going to be very hard to get sustainably higher inflation in the real economy when you have velocity um, and the over indebtedness that we have because that transition mechanism is, is broken. Um, so maybe if I would throw it back to you, do you want to maybe get into that concept of all this money that's been created is now getting trapped in the financial system? And I think, you know, the break apart the difference between asset inflation and, you know, your traditional consumer price inflation, because I think, you know, people sometimes get those two confused. Right. Yeah, I think that that's the key point that we want to go with here, because it actually looks like there's going to be inflation that traditional CPI, consumer price inflation this year. We're not saying it's not there, where it's been running about one, one and a half percent in North, you know, North America, Canada and the US really sort of mimic each other. But we might get a headline number of 3% this year. So just before I touch on that, that was really just to highlight and we were going to put up that we put up those slides. It's extraordinary to see these two slides together, which is one is that how much the money supply has gone up and that reciprocal that the velocity of money has gone down equal to, equal to that. But we're caught in this one point in time which makes it so complicated right now, which is, is inflation going to go up? And absolutely, right now, inflation is going up. But so far, it seems like we're, it's, it's because we have supply disruptions. We can't get goods to the people that want to use them. And two things just in the commodity space, whether we're looking at copper or lumber, there's just tightness in the supply there's people want to get back to work and you can't get the supply to the people that want to use it. That's te and now technically it goes through the numbers as inflationary and we're going to have supply disruption inflation short term. But the much, much bigger picture, which is so much more important, is this velocity of money, is that the money has gone into the banks, but they're not lending it because there's really technically and this is a whole discussion itself, but there's nobody to lend it to. And which and if that's the case, you can't get the whole economy humming in an, an inflationary, you know, wage driven uh, inflation. And so and just to conclude on that, why this is so important is that our overall conclusions is that once we come through this short term, what we'd say, you know, recovery in inflation, we should go back to a world where interest rates are still low. 
They might not be super low as they were a year ago, but will still be in this band of very low inflation, in which case that sets the tone for the bond market. And, and more importantly, stocks seem like they're expensive today, but our case that if interest rates stay at this low level, stocks will remain at a high valuation. And it, it's so fundamental to get those uh, those things right. Yeah, I think no, I think that's that's a great great way to wrap it up. Is there, was there anything else that you wanted to? Well, oh, just in? say so, and I'll ask you now, now Brian. Yeah. That this is a definitive thing that we say, uh, so it's sort of with our outlook for the next twelve months. But is there a way that our outlook could change? Yeah. So okay. So the the one way this could change is, um, and this is going to be a very jargony thing to say, but what would change the the current dynamic and the framework is that. If governments or central banks became um, so desperate uh, that they move into a, a regime where they make the central bank's liabilities legal tender, um, and that legal tender distinction is important because uh, right now, it, by law, the Federal Reserve in the U.S. or the Bank of Canada in Canada, they can't actually create spendable money into the economy. They can only create uh, bank reserves, which then um, you know, go through the regular banking channel. And so this concept of the central bank is printing money is is they're not actually printing money, they're creating bank reserves and the banks are then um, having that money get trapped in the banking system. So, but what would change that is if you actually change the liabilities of the, of the central bank to create spendable money, which would, that would be a, a game changer for, I think for everything, because you'd be walking into a framework um, you know, much like the, um, you know, historical uh, analogies that people like to bring up, whether it's, um, you know, Weimar Germany or the French Revolution, French Republic, um, Shanghai Shek in China uh, and Japan, Imperial Japan as well. So these, the, it's a whole other regime change that you could, um, you know, we certainly hope that we aren't walking into, but it, it really is comes down to that distinction of if the central bank changes its legal uh, it, it's res, it's liabilities to legal tender. That would be the game changer where everything would change. But from from all um, you know observations right now, we're not close to that. And but that's a very key distinction um, that we would make in terms of how all of this would change, and that you actually would would be walking into a much more inflationary kind of regime. Yeah, and I would just finish up on points that our conclusion even today, and our conclusion even if. You know, if the monetary system changes dramatically, you, you really have to own something. Our, our core fundamental belief is a hard asset company, a highly profitable company that com compounds. You, you can't have your money just in, you know, currency or bonds or the bank. You actually have to have your money working for you and invested in hard assets to maintain your maintain the value of your money or the, of, yeah. your, of your wealth. So it's not the money, the cash, the, you know, the money is going down in value. But to maintain your wealth, you have to have it in something. That retains its value. Yeah, and I think that just to, to kind of conclude on that, I think it's not that our expectations that this would happen, but it's a key reason why we like to focus so much on owning hard, tangible assets because um, there's the there, you know in any of these potentials, owning something that is tangible and physical, whether it's buildings in real estate or pipelines or energy distribution or other parts of the portfolio. Um, when you own a tangible asset in that kind of an environment, it, it is one way to protect yourself from the inflation and to maintain the, the purchasing power of, of your capital uh, if we were to head into a situation like that. Um, so why don't we wrap it up on there? We'll get this up on the website uh, shortly and, uh, and we'll look forward to the next conversation. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. You can find us on avenueinvestment.com where you can learn more about the topics discussed today at our blog or subscribe for updates to our content. You can also follow us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.